Well, church family, we are once again in Acts chapter 13. As I mentioned last Sunday, uh, this, is, this is one of those sections in Acts that we most clearly and most explicitly see how the Holy Spirit is leading the early church. Last week we considered the first three verses. I thought I might be able to get through all 12 verses last week, but that was not the case. We considered the first three verses specifically looking at how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. We saw how the Holy Spirit speaks to all types of Christians, no matter your ethnic background, your socioeconomic background. And then we considered the optimal conditions in which the Holy Spirit speaks to us. You remember what those optimal conditions were? Serving, worshiping together, praying, and fasting. It's the most, it's, it's very important for us to know that the, the primary way that the Spirit speaks to us is through His Word. So today, we're looking at three more acts of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer has been that especially in this time and especially in this season that we find ourselves in, that we would, as a church and as individuals, become more aware and more conscious of the operations of the Spirit. I say all this because I have another announcement. <laughs> We've had a lot of announcements today. I got one more. Next week on Sunday during the Sunday school hour, we set aside a special Sunday school time um, between 9.15 and 10.15 in the fellowship hall. All adults and high schoolers are invited to join us. What we're talking about as a supplement to both last week's sermon and this week's sermon, as well as the entire book of Acts, the operations of the Holy Spirit. How is it that the Spirit has been working from Genesis through Revelation? And so I uh, wanted to, to make, put that commercial out there for that. Uh, 9.15 next Sunday, please be on time if you can, because uh, there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, but that's, that's that. And with that said, I ask the congregation to please rise for the reading of God's Word. Reading from Acts chapter 13, verse 1 through verse 12. Now there, were in Antioch, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and saw and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. 
This is God's word for God's people. May we have ears to hear it and let us receive it as such. You may be seated. Last week, I, I introduced you to someone near, uh, very dear to me. His name was Frank Moore, uh, a, a spirit-filled man from Florida. However, none of you had ever heard of him, nor should you have. Tis, today, I would like to talk to you about another spirit-led man of whom I am sure that all of you have heard of. And in fact, I am pretty sure all of you either heard his name this week or thought about him in the last few days. His name was Patrick. Heard of him? St. Patrick is another example of a man led by the Holy Spirit. And I think there is a need for us to reclaim St. Patrick. He's a great missionary of the church. Unfortunately, I think that when we hear about Patrick, the first thing that comes to mind are little green men or shamrocks. Green beer. And we have to sift through a lot of fictional accounts, a lot of folklore, before we can get to who Patrick really was. And so over 1,500 years ago, there was a real man named Patrick. Patrick was not even born on Ireland, did you know that? He was born in the Roman territory of Britain. He would be a teenager when he was apprehended and brought to Ireland and sold into slavery. He was a slave for six years. And it was during that time that he was converted to Christianity. He also gained a reputation for being a very fervent evangelist. After six years, he escaped, went back to Britain, and while there, guess what? He heard the Spirit speak, not in an audible voice. It was through service and fasting and prayer. It was like what we saw in verse 2. It was like what we talked about last week. The Spirit spoke to St. Patrick in the same way the Spirit spoke to the church in Antioch. And just like Saul and Barnabas, Patrick was sent back to Ireland. It was there where he faced opposition. But in the end, many people were saved through the churches he planted in Ireland. Last week, we looked at how the Spirit speaks, and that's verses 1 through 3. Today, we begin by seeing how the Spirit sends. So the first, if you're in the note-taking type, if you want to have an outline, the Spirit sends. For the church here in Antioch, upon hearing from the Holy Spirit while worshiping, serving together, while fasting and praying together, it was made clear to the church that the Spirit was calling Barnabas and Saul. Hands were laid upon them. Verse 4, so being sent by the Holy Spirit. Notice it doesn't say the church sent them, the Holy Spirit sent them. The sending of Barnabas and Saul, likely the most gifted people in the church too, was initiated, directed by the Holy Spirit. The church heard and obeyed what was told to them by God. The, the God we serve is the initiator. 
Our God is a God who sends. Barnabas and Saul were sent. First, they went to Seleucia, which if you're on the map, um, so Syria, the coast is Seleucia, and then they sailed to Cyprus. Cyprus is the second largest island in the Mediterranean, and there was a Jewish population there. The first place to go is where they can build the biggest bridge between Judaism and the good news of Jesus Christ is the synagogue. And that's where they proclaim the word of God. It was strategic, and it would become their pattern. And we're going to see this as we go on in chapters to come. Here at Calvary, the Holy Spirit sends what we often call missionaries. Last week, I was in a car with one of them for several hours. Many of you know and love and have been praying for Spencer and Carmen Ewing. Spencer and his family, they have three little girls, the youngest of which is seven months old right now. And we should be praying for them in a few months. They are going to be going to the other side of the globe, Malaysia. God is ascending God. Now you may be asking yourself, is, is this sending just a New Testament thing? I would strongly urge you not to think that way. God has been sending people from the beginning. And we see that most clearly in the prophets of the Old Testament. For instance, Moses. This is Exodus 3, verse 10. Therefore, come now, this is God speaking, and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. And there's very straight lines that we can draw between the exodus and salvation. Freedom from bondage to the Egyptians and freedom from bondage to sin and death. Not just Moses, we see this in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. He says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah responds, Here I am. Send me. Similar with Jeremiah, same with Ezekiel. But not every prophet was that willing. Do you remember the prophet Jonah? God sends this man out of his comfort zone into the land of Nineveh. Jonah goes exactly in the opposite direction. And how does that work out for him in the end? Not too good. And you may be asking yourself, well, why does God send? And this is one of those questions where if we consider who God is himself, we get the idea of why the church is called to do what it does. If we get an idea of who God is, we get a better sense of why it is that we send. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternal. Jesus was sent into this world, 1 John 4, 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. We are saved because God is ascending God. And just as the son is sent, the spirit is sent. Galatians 4, 6, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Again, God is a sending God. Now, here's where I bring all this up. My suspicion is that when some of us think that God is a sending God, the way that that is applied is rather limited. Limited only to missionaries. Limited only to pastors. 
But while that is certainly that there are extraordinary sending actions like missionaries, like Paul and Barnabas, we should all know and be clear of the fact that we are all sent. We are all called to be sent. Think about it. If it if we talk about being spirit-led. If we're being spirit-led, think of that action. You are going somewhere. <laughs> the spirit is sending you somewhere. If you are spirit-led, you are being sent. So the question is, what am I being sent to? Or who am I being sent to? All of us have a vocation. For instance, uh, you, you may be a salesman, like my friend Frank. You may be a, a mechanic. You, you have some kind of trade. But as a Christian, you have been given a higher vocation. A way to serve the church serve the Lord with an eternal purpose, an eternal ramification. If you are a mother or a father, there's your primary mission field. Not the only mission field, but the primary one. Young people in the room, if you have brothers and sisters or cousins, you are called and sent to them. Show them what grace looks like. Show them what mercy looks like. Show them what forgiveness looks like. Show them that we don't need the empty things of this world. For sure, there are, there are extraordinary callings to be missionaries and pastors like Paul and Barnabas. But it was not just them who were called. It's a little bit of evidence of this. Look at verse 5. They needed an assistant. <laughs> John was also sent This is John Mark. He would be the one who writes the gospel according to Mark. So there's no doubt about it. The Spirit sends. The Spirit-led Christian is a Spirit-sent Christian. The Spirit-led church is a Spirit-sent church. And that's why the sermon series in the book of Acts as a whole is on mission together. It's entitled that. Because we're together in this. So, not only does the Spirit send, and the second point here, the Spirit identifies and triumphs over opposition. The Spirit identifies and triumphs over opposition. And thus far, we've seen opposition of all kinds. Mainly, it's come from the religious rulers, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. However, We've also seen it from the civic rulers. Uh, King Herod, for instance, with the killing of James a couple chapters ago. We've even seen opposition come from within the church. One thing that is guaranteed that as the word of God moves forward, there will always be opposition. And so here is Paul and or Saul, not Paul yet, and Barnabas, and, and, and they have this tremendous opportunity to come about. Look at verse 7. The proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, and he summons Saul and Barnabas because he sought to hear the word of God. You may be like, what, what's a proconsul? Is it like a mayor? Um, actually, it's a little bit bigger than that. And so imagine that you uh, and I are missionaries. We're part of a missionary team. We're going to go to a foreign land. And then the president of this small country tells you, hey, we want to hear what you have to say. We want to hear the word of God. Uh, 
However, there's, again, always going to be opposition. And we should note the, the irony of, of this Jewish false prophet, this magician. His name is Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus, that's what it means. And as he's hearing from Saul and Barnabas, the proconsul, on the other side of him, you can kind of picture him, there's somebody who has his ear, this false prophet. The magician trying to convince him otherwise. It's at that moment. Now, you notice it says Saul to, to Paul, and, and just to be clear, Paul is his Roman name. This is like when I go to Latin America and I speak to our Latin American brothers. Guess what? My name is an angel. It's on him. Just there. I like it when it's angel on you. But that's the same kind of thing happening here. He becomes Paul because that's his Roman name, and he realizes the context in which he's serving. And in that moment, Paul becomes aware of what is actually happening. And so here is the mark, a mark, of a spirit-led man or woman. It's also the mark of a spirit-led church. It's becoming attuned and aware of satanic opposition when it comes. Spirit-led person will know and sense satanic opposition when it comes. I realize that to some of you that may seem like mumbo-jumbo, but it's not. It's a spiritual battle that we face. It's not flesh and blood that we do battle with. It's spiritual forces. There's always going to be opposition. We need to be able to identify it for what it is. Call it out. Listen to what Paul says. You son of the devil. In other words, you're not bar Jesus. son of Jesus. No, you are the son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? He says, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Now, this is Paul he has got some experience with this blindness business, does he not? Remember chapter 9? And just as we saw chapter 9, you remember, remember this. Despite the opposition, God's mission is unstoppable. And that should really encourage us. Despite the opposition, God's mission is unstoppable. The Spirit sends... The Spirit identifies and triumphs over opposition. The third point, last one. In the end, the Spirit saves. And the Spirit can save any man. The proconsul believed. Through this event, from what he saw and from what he heard from the Word of God, he believed. We were not given too many details about this. But something does stand out about this one. Some of you are familiar with the name John Stott. He's a pastor, probably one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. And he makes this observation about this, and he's dead on. It seems as if the writer of Acts, Luke, is intending us to see this man, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, as the first totally Gentile convert. 
Not that he is the first, but he's trying to show us something is happening here. Because everybody else that we've talked about, we've talked about Cornelius. You remember Cornelius? You remember the Ethiopian eunuch? They all had some kind of religious background. They were God-fearers. They had some kind of Jewish knowledge about the scriptures. It's not the case with this man. What he's trying to tell us is the Spirit can save anyone, despite your background. No matter what you have done or not done, the Spirit can save anyone. Church, do you believe that? If you're sitting here today and maybe you have been attending this church for a while, or maybe you have been even a member of this church and you've said all the right things and you've gone through the motions, but you have never truly believed Maybe there's, there's someone else in your ear. Or maybe the things of this world have you deceived. I'm calling for what it is, the lie. The truth is that the God who made all things, who made this world, his anger, his wrath, is aimed at sin. His wrath will be poured out upon it. But he made a way to redeem a people for himself. I call you the same way Paul calls Sergius Paulus, Repent, believe, and you will be saved. I'm going to pray for us this morning using a prayer I have modified a bit. It is attributed to St. Patrick. I don't think he wrote it. Nonetheless, it's a good prayer for us, especially during this season right now. Would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we arise today. Through your strength, we ask to pilot us. Through your might, uphold us. May your wisdom guide us. May your eye look before us. May your ear hear us. May your word speak to us. May your hand guard us. May your way lie before us. May your shield protect us. May your hosts save us, afar and anear, alone or in a multitude. Christ, shield us today. Shield us today against wounding. Christ with us. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ in us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us, Christ on our right, Christ on our left, Christ when we lie down, Christ when we sit down. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of us. Christ in the eye that sees us. Christ in the ear that hears us. We arise today through the mighty strength of the Lord Jesus. 
the Lord over all creation. We praise him. Amen.